Over the years, the home team has worked closely together with the community to keep Singapore a safe and secure home. In 2012, our crime rate fell for the seventh consecutive year to the lowest in nearly three decades. Our recidivism rate is stable. Our fire fatality rate remains very low. The number of immigration offenders has steadily declined. The number of road fatalities has also started to come down. However, we are acutely aware that any fatality or serious crime is a tragedy in itself and can have a detrimental effect on our sense of safety and security. This is one reason why community partnerships and engagements are so important. They create a sense of collective ownership for safety and security, which in itself provides a sense of assurance that issues can be addressed and overcome. Our collective sense of safety and security provides a strong foundation upon which our society has been able to develop and prosper. It has also helped to make Singapore a good place to live and bring up families. While the situation today is relatively good, we still face difficult security challenges and must remain vigilant to ensure that Singapore continues to be a safe home for all Singaporeans. Our approach to safety and security is underpinned by three pillars, robust laws, effective enforcement, and strong community partnerships. This comprehensive approach allows us to tackle issues both upstream and downstream. We are also concerned by terrorist elements growing use of social media to spread propaganda and recruit new radicals. With Singapore's high internet penetration, especially among youths, we need to inoculate our young from coming under the influence of radical ideology. This is even more critical, given that it is not easy to de-radicalize a person once he has imbibed terrorist ideology. A specific case in point is former detainee Abdul Bashir, son of Abdul Qadir, who was a self-radicalized individual. He was detained from 2007 to 2010 as he had made specific plans to pursue militant jihad in Afghanistan. After his release in February 2010, he initially made some progress in reintegrating into society. However, while under the ISA post-release supervision regime, he was detected to have reverted to his past interest in undertaking militant jihad abroad. He even made inquiries as to how he could leave Singapore illegally, if necessary, to pursue his jihad plans. ISD had to re-arrest him in September 2012 and placed him under detention the following month to prevent him from pursuing his violent agenda. Abdul Bashir is a timely reminder that Singapore must continue to invest efforts in the rehabilitation of our terrorist detainees. Since January 2002, 64 persons have been detained under the ISA for their involvement in terrorism-related activities. Of these 64, more than two-thirds have been released after they were assessed to have been rehabilitated and not to pose a security threat that warranted preventive detention. This is why the work of the Religious Rehabilitation Group, RRG, in counselling the detainees is so important and must continue. To commemorate its 10th anniversary, the RRG will be co-organising an international conference on terrorist rehabilitation and community resilience later this month with the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies. The conference will bring together experts and practitioners from Egypt, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, the US, as well as European and ASEAN countries to share best practices and lessons learned. And this will include, as I said, experts from Saudi Arabia, whose centre I visited last year, or centre I visited just a few months ago. 